Hello, everybody. I hope uh, you all had a good break. Uh, I missed you for those couple of two weeks. I didn't see you. You're a fun crowd. It's fun to be back for our last lecture. Uh, it's been a long journey in the world of supernovae. We explored how stars explode, what kind of different stars in different give rise to different types of explosions, how important the explosions are for cosmology, how important they are even for life, and how do they shape some very fundamental properties of the universe around us. So today I'm going to close off uh, with an epilogue to discuss where do we go from here, where we are, where we've been, where we are, and what's the future, where we're heading in terms of uh, supernova instance. And, uh, it looks like with uh, advancements in uh, modern technology, as well as uh, supercomputing, we're heading to a really exciting direction. Uh, so, where do we go from here? I want to start by emphasizing the role, again, once more, of amateur astronomers in the community. You know, we're professional astrophysicists. We spend a lot of time in front of our computers, analyze data, we go to meetings, but we don't have our eyes up in the sky all the time. There's people uh, with passion about the sky and the universe. Simple, simple everyday people that just love buying a telescope, crowdfunding their own home research institute, and they spend hours and hours looking at the sky. And it turns out these people have uh, provided us with a really wealthy amount of data and even discoveries that we were not there to capture, but they captured because there's a lot of eyes in the sky. Uh, so I want to I want to really uh, say that I feel grateful to these uh, grassroots amateur astronomers who spend their own money look at the sky. And this is the one example right here. It's Tim Puckett. Uh, this individual you know spent a lot of money to buy his own telescope, uh, and he founded the Puckett Observatory Supernova Search or POS. So it's a citizen science movement. People get together and just look for supernovae every night. And it turns out that actually amateur astronomers have discovered more than 300 supernovae so far. You know? And if you really want to think about it, those first supernova explosions and uh, the historical supernova I was discussing, uh, discovered by the Chinese uh, or the early Europeans, uh, were actually kind of like citizen science. So they weren't really professional astronomers, they were stargazers. Um, and uh, they take it a step further now. They're utilizing the internet. They're utilizing. Yes, sir. One, one quick second. Yeah. Um, remember last month I said that um, I had made the uh, op primary optics for the uh, telescope that discovered the whirlpool supernova in 1994. Yeah. April Fool, back in college. It was Tim Puckett who did it. Uh, and, uh, yeah, he's built a, a little bit bigger telescope since. But, <laughs> yeah. Um, but not, not that much bigger than one he So, citizen, so, yeah, thank you for uh, bringing that up. So, yeah, think by the NTC, as well as utilizing the internet, social media, uh, people organize all over the world to do supernova science, to do citizen science. This is extremely amazing. They even discovered a new class of supernova. The first. Uh, member of type 1A X supernovae, which is basically type 1A explosions, explosions of white dwarfs, but they're way more subluminous than the original type 1As. They, have. they emit less radiation, less light. Uh, though the first one of these type was discovered by, uh, by citizen scientists, uh, as well as more than 300 supernovae and many exciting transient events, or even comets and stuff like that. So this is where it all started. It all started with people passionate about stargazing and looking up at the sky to find new things. And then that's where we professional you know, uh, astronomers and technology and automation comes in. And that was a revolution in uh, supernova astrophysics. We started like building telescopes that were fully automated and independent without human in, uh, interaction or intervention. They could just be programmed to scan the sky arbitrarily on a daily basis uh, and look at different parts of the sky discovering new traces. And advancements in robotics, artificial intelligence, and uh, machine learning, and all these fancy computer science techniques over the last few years really triggered that uh, revolution, this transient search process. So now we're in, we're in a place where we can have eyes much better than our naked eyes, or telescopes, that are programmed to go over strips of the sky 
and looking for things that were not there before by comparing to images from the previous night. And that led to a revolution and led to the discovery of thousands of new trains into supernovae. And I want to give it up here for uh, a place uh, and a collaboration that I was involved in uh, when I was a graduate student at the University of Texas at Austin, the Rothschild Telescope Network. So this is one of the earliest and first examples. There were, there were supernova searches, of course, in other places. There was places in Berkeley, in Harvard. But what this project brought to the table, which was new, was to not target specific bright galaxies, which is what the other projects did. They said, OK, it's more likely we're going to find supernova exploding in big, bright galaxies. So we're just going to target our search to these galaxies. Uh, what this project did, and what it evolved to, was basically looking blindly, unbiased in the sky, everywhere. I don't care if you're a bright galaxy or if you're a dim galaxy. I don't care if I don't see really any galaxy in this field. I'm going to keep looking because you never know. There might be interesting transients in places where we, we're not looking at. So the robotic optical transient search experiment was born. It's, a, it's initially uh, a project that was initiated by a professor at the University of Michigan. And the, the initial reason for this project was basically to follow up gamma ray bursts. Remember, lecture five, we talked about gamma ray bursts, this beamed explosions, this beamed energetic explosions. And one of the most important things to understand these explosions was to look at the afterglow, to basically look at the light after this very brief burst that lasted 30 seconds or so. And this is what this project was built for. And just because we want to have caverns all the time, 24 7, in all areas of the sky, we built, we built four robotic telescopes scattered around the world. There's one in West Texas, in Fort Davis. Uh, McDonald Observatory, there's one in South Africa, one in Australia, and one in Turkey. So we have pretty good coverage of the north and the south and hemisphere. And those robotic telescopes, now, what do you need to, to do this? Let's talk a little about instrumentation and the technicalities behind it. You want to look at large portions of the sky, as deep as possible, because you want to capture those transients when they're dim before they actually start getting brighter and brighter, so you're going to follow the revolution as they brighten up. And you want to do this very fast, rapid cadence. You want to do this fast because the faster you discover them, the earlier you catch them, and the more you can constrain their properties by following how their light falls. Uh, so you need a telescope with a big field of view that looks at a large chunk of the sky simultaneously. And those telescopes, uh, we quantify them by using basically square degrees. But you can think of it as looking in a field of view that is three times the sun. So if you were to uh, draw an angle from yourself to the sun, look at the angular size of the sun, it's going to, be about, it's going to take about half a degree on the sky. So imagine these telescopes were about you know, three times or four times uh, bigger field of view. Uh, and also it was very fast. As soon as there was a gamma ray burst discovered, because that's what the initial purpose of this project was, it took six seconds for the automated system to send an email to those telescopes and to other networks around the world to follow up the transfer. It's pretty, pretty rapid cadence. And the, the ROTSA project that later transitioned to the Texas Supernova Search Project, which was specifically aimed at finding new supernovae, and the ROTSA, the RSVP, ROTSA Supernova Verification Project. Uh, so we could point and shoot within six seconds of discovery. And Roche has generated some of the most fascinating supernova discoveries over the last 10 years, including, as I talked about in the last lecture, the first superluminous supernovae were discovered by this project. Uh, a lot of gamma reverse uh, follow-ups. We discovered one of the first weird transient, which we call a uh, tidal disruption in them. This is not a topic for this lecture series, but it basically uh, happens when you have a black hole disturbing a star have a transient uh, event happening as it swallows up its mass. And those are pretty rare. They have very specific characteristics. And one of the first of these events was discovered by the Russian telescope. And the, here you see uh, in the West Texas mountains uh, the big Hobie Everly telescope uh, in the background and the Rotsi robotic telescope in the foreground. So what, what we do, what we did in Texas was to discover transients with this one. And then immediately, if we see something that looked interesting, we triggered the big telescope to get spectra, to try to get more detail of this uh, event. And to give you an understanding how fast you got to be in real time, 
when you, when you scan the sky to look for this new strain. See, this is a little video of uh, Roche in action, which it doesn't want to play. <laughs> So you will see now, we'll turn it on and you see how fast, this is real time, this is how fast. Imagine the, the technicality and you know the, the accuracy that goes behind scanning the sky so fast at the same time not having you know, weird effects on your pictures as you drive along. So you know, this, is, this is not easy. Uh, and then of course, once Rodse discovered those first transients and people and there was a lot of hype in the community about superluminous supernovae and the new class of these explosions that tend to 100 times brighter than regular supernova explosions, then there's, there was a lot of money put in in other institutions to do the same thing with better instruments. So Rodse was kind of like the beginning, but then you had the Passer Collaboration Project or the Panoramic Survey Telescope and Rapid Response System. Same principle, based in Hawaii, uh, they're using four telescopes with a uh, diameter of about 2 meters, 1.8 meters uh, long. And this one has even a bigger field of view. Roxy had, it's about two times Roxy's field of view, so three degrees. So six suns, you know, region. Uh, and the reason they initially designed it was to actually look for near-Earth objects or comets and asteroids, potentially dangerous objects to the Earth. But it turns out that you can use the same high canvas principles of the instrument to uh, modify it specifically for discovering uh, supernovae. So that's a passage project. Now, of course, uh, the biggest re revolution later on as technology got better and more money were put in. And of course, being in Caltech helped because it's a big institution. The California Institute of Technology uh, 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 started the Palomar Transient Factory project, which was based in the very historical uh, Palomar Observatory. Uh, using initially they started out with some older equipment, but over time they got more funding and they, they kept adding more features and better, faster telescopes, better CCD cameras. Does anybody here know what a CCD camera is? Okay, it stands for charge coupled device, and it's the main instrument, the main camera we use to uh, record stellar light. It's the most accurate. It's digital. It's electronic. What happens is you get light from the source. It hits a very sensitive surface and then generates current. And then you measure how much current you generate between uh, be underneath each pixel. Okay. It has pixels. And then you call that for an image of a certain thing that you're looking at. Uh, and this technology has revolutionized the generation of astrophysics. Before that, we had photographic plates. The response there was pretty weird and pretty non-linear. And this is a more linear, more uh, concise response to the, to the stimuli. So CCDs, they, they use some pretty good, pretty expensive uh, CCDs with uh, 248 by 496 uh, pixels across. So you can imagine that that's 200 to 400 times better than your iPhone's camera in terms of resolution. And it looks deeper than that. You, you can record things uh, more, it's more sensitive uh, to light. And the outcome of the initial phase of the PDF project of the Palomar Transient Factory was the discovery over the last over, over a period of less than two years, actually, they discovered uh, 2.5 thousand uh, supernovae. Most of them were type 1a, a few uh, type other types, a core collapse supernovae. And then there was this little, this rare type of more superluminous supernovae that they discovered as well. So there's so much wealth of data at this point that they didn't have enough graduate students to analyze all this data. <laughs> so there's still cheap labor, right? So there's still a lot of uh, un, you know, unreduced data waiting around. Uh, so people are trying to develop data analysis, machine learning, automated techniques to analyze data that humans, there's not enough human power to, to analyze. Uh, and now the next phase of the PDF project, and that's Fritz Vicky, one of the most historic, yet very awkward personality in, uh, in the field of astronomy. Uh, it's kind of weird. But he's a brilliant guy, and uh, the next step of the Palomar Transient Factory would be the Zwicky Transient Factory, in, in honor of Fritz Zwicky. Uh, and it's going to be instated, it's going to be first light in 2017. It's going to be a major upgrade. We're going to have 47 square degrees field of view. Large, really, really large chunks of the sky simultaneously. Several times the diameter of the sun. Unprecedented. And it's going to be much faster. Within an hour, you'll be able to scan almost the entire northern hemisphere. It's pretty fast for this uh, kind of business. 
And you can look down to pretty uh, dim objects, down to 21 magnitudes. Remember, the, the bigger the magnitude is, the dimmer the object is. And with your naked eye, you can only see up to magnitude 6. That's the dimmest you can see. Now, magnitude 21 is way, 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 way dimmer. And this, can, this uh, instrument can uh, capture that. So 6.5 million times dimmer than Sirius, which is the brightest, sky, uh, the brightest star in the sky. OK? So, and it has the potential to discover yeah, very young supernova very early on, even up to a day, you know, after the explosion. So we can really use this technology to constrain the properties of these explosions very early on. And of course, there's other uh, applications that it's based on. Now, of course, I need to mention that there's a lot of private involvement in this business. So, there is the Las Cumbres Observatory Global Telescope uh, Network, or LCOGT, which is now being built uh, in Santa Barbara, California. And this is primarily uh, an endowment given by, by a wealthy individual. Uh, it has two aspects on it. One aspect is to look into transients like supernovae. Uh, discover, it's the same principle, very fast cadence, big field of view. Discover as many transients as early, as early as possible. Uh, and there's going to be, one of the upgrades is that it's going to be in a way more places. It's going to be covering a lot of the uh, fields of view around the Earth. We're going to have one in Texas, in Chile, South Africa, in, Can in Canary Islands, in Spain. One, uh, that's a big question mark because you can never trust the Chinese government. Um, <laughs> uh, in Australia and in Hawaii. So there's going to be a bunch of telescopes scattered around the world in this network. And one of the main uh, reasons it, it raises private money uh, is because an aspect of it would be educational. So those telescopes would be used to train students. Uh, how to do observations and things like that, how to use automated techniques. And that intrigued people that wanted to give money. Um, so this is the LCOGT, and this is a one prototype here, Santa Barbara. Uh, now, we built this technology, and we built those instruments and res really rapid response systems to discover supernova early on. But then, of course, we need more and better and more accurate and bigger telescopes and spectrographs and all kinds of instruments to understand what's going on once we discover supernova. So you can see where the future is going in terms of discovering supernova. I just talked about that. But then the next step is understanding them and following, up, following them up as accurately as possible in time and grasping as much light as possible from these events. So what do what we do, what do we observational, I'm theoretical, but observational as supernova astrophysicists, as, as astrophysicists, what they do is they cheat the system in a way, in a good way, though. It, you know, it's for a good reason. When you have these really expensive telescopes, Hubble Space Telescope, or uh, the uh, Swift UVOD, uh, ultraviolet telescope, which are orbital telescopes that go around the Earth, uh, and they have provided us with extreme insight about the universe, uh, there's a lot of astronomers that naturally want to use them. Thousands of astronomers around the world are applying for time to use this telescope. So there's a lot of competition trying to get observations from this. However, if you, if you discover a supernova, you don't really have time for competition or bureaucracy. You need observations as soon as possible. So they've they, been stated a uh, so-called target of opportunity requests for fields like supernova astrophysics, where if we find something that we think is really interesting, we skip the line, yeah. and we get proud of it, and we get some special treatment. So the, this policy, this target of opportunity policy is also helping, and it's helping us use really good quality, expensive equipment to get really detailed observations, spectra, to measure the composition, the light, the polarization, everything about these events. Try to understand as many things as possible, as many pieces of the puzzles uh, as possible. Now, you do that, and you do all the observations, and uh, you discover supernovae early, and you follow them up very accurately, and then you are with this wealth of data that are laying right in front of you that, ex that expect you to understand them. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> I like cloud swords. <laughs> so, uh, so how do we do this? And this is where we, uh, theoretical astrophysicists come in. This is where computational astrophysicists come in. We try to use the laws of physics and science uh, and computer science to build models, as I've repeatedly presented to you in this class, in this lecture series, 
to understand, to model, to simulate the processes that give rise to these tremendous explosions. So, but this is very difficult. This is a whole different enterprise in itself. So you have millions and millions of dollars poured in this fast raising projects, but you also have millions and millions of dollars poured in uh, supercomputers and technology that enables us to simulate supernovae. And the reason we need those big, those big machines is because A, nature is complicated, B, nature is complicated because it's three dimensional, and C, physics is complicated. So to describe a physical system, there is different pieces of physics that we need to involve, depending on the system, different scales. So to understand something, we need to go, uh, we need to decide what's the smaller scale that we need to resolve to understand it, up to the bigger scale that's necessary for the simulation. But that's just kind of like the spatial constraints. You also have time, temporal constraints. For how long? What is the time scale for which you accurately need to simulate a physical system in order to get an idea of what's going on? And those two things combined, doing three-dimensional simulations, solving all these non-linear, uh, interdependent systems of equations in this tremendous amount of resolution, is very computationally expensive. It would take you tens of years, maybe hundreds of years, for some of these problems to run in your lab. That is why we employ supercomputers like the one pictured here, which is the mirror supercomputer. Those machines take up entire rooms. This is one of the. This is the fifth largest supercomputer in the world, and it's right here in Argon Laboratory. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about how they work. Very basic stuff how many cores they have. So, you know, for example, your laptops might have one or two CPUs, in some cases four CPUs, and so on and so forth. Those machines have hundreds of thousands of CPU cores, parallelized. So take your laptop and multiply it by several thousands to get horsepower that we need to do supernova astrophysics. And we can do this from the comfort and warmth of our office, <laughs> you know, uh, because uh, we can use the internet and we can uh, log in at SSH. That's a, that's a jargon we use. Uh, uh, log in remotely from our terminals to these machines, set those simulations up using a code like Flash, which is, which is the Flash is what I'm working on. I'm going to advertise a little more towards the end of the talk. And run those things here and spend millions of CPU hours, millions of computer hours. Uh, even in these big machines, you can't do everything. You know? And I'm going to talk about the future of supercomputing, or scientific uh, computing. So, we like to say that right now we're in the pentaflop era. What does it mean? <laughs> right? Pentaflop. What's that word? It's alien language. But a flop is a quantity that we use to measure computational power, computational efficiency, in a way. It stands for floating point number oper operations. What is, an opera what is a floating point operation? First of all, what is a floating number? A floating number is a real number. It's a number that, that has decimal points. You know, pi is a floating number in computer language. 2.34621 is a floating number. Mm -hmm. And then you can have uh, operations between floating numbers, like addition, subtraction, multiplication, or division. This is a floating point operation. You take 2.6 and you add it to 1.3. That's a one floating point operation. And that operation takes a certain amount of time to be completed in a machine, in a computer. The more operations you can do per second, per second, the stronger and more uh, powerful is your machine. So when I say we're in the pe petaflop era, I mean that we are in a place right now where we can do 10 to the 15 operations every second in these supercomputers. Take one followed by 15 zeros every second. And the future is going to be the exascale era. So these are some examples of petaflop uh, uh, large-scale system. This is the mirror, which I saw you before. This is a different angle of it. By the way, it's really expensive to power these things. You don't want to pay that electrical bill from Comet if you want to do this. You're going to be broke in a month. So that's another challenge. It takes personnel, it takes people, human resources, it takes technical uh, skills, and it takes a lot of energy to power those power. Some of these machines are partially powered by small nuclear guys. So, you know, it's, it's, it's an expensive enterprise. Um, this is Mira. I've used this several times for, uh, for some of my work. It has 786,000 processors. So, 
One day of running simulations utilizing the entire horsepower of Mira, you know, would be more like for a simple for a simple problem would be like 20 days in a modern plan. For more complicated problems, it would be you know years. So Stampede is the other machine I'm using. It's a it's a supercomputer at the University of Texas, at the Texas Advanced Computing Center. Uh, 9.6 petaflops, so 10 to, almost 10 to the 16 floating hours <coughs> per second. And you have Hopper, uh, and then you, the biggest one in the United States currently is Titan. It's in the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. It's an NVIDIA crane system. This is at 20 petaflops. It's a really fast, really powerful machine. And most of these, uh, most of the horsepower for this machine is actually used for uh, for uh, non proprietary research, so, you know, private. Uh, Military, defense yeah. related stuff. So it's not used always for peaceful reasons. The physics is the same. Uh, and what's the future of computing? Obviously, when you know, we talk about pentascale, what's the next or you know, three orders of magnitude? A thousand times stronger computers in the future would be the exascale. Those are machines that can, can uh, do 10 to the 18 floating operations per second. And the, the challenge, of course, is the energy required to power these machines. You go up in horsepower, you go up in, uh, in machinery, your electric bill, you know, currently is about 3.5 billion a year, it's gonna go up. So it requires new technology to be able to do this. It requires cores, it requires CPUs that are more energy efficient, which we call GPUs, graphic processing units, instead of uh, core processing units. Uh, and the GPU technology has been developed, uh, you know, it's around and it's been perfected. Slowly and perhaps around you know 2030, 2020, we'll enter uh, the uh, pentaflop, the exaflop era of scientific computing that will lead to a lot of revolutions in theoretical astrophysics. <laughs> you could even do small uh, scale stellar evolution 3D calculations with this. No, you cannot do the entire life of the star, but you can do big chunks of the life of the star in 3D. It will be very important for uh, scientific computing. And now this is, you know, the edge between science fiction, not really science fiction, but, you know. The future is uh, people, there's a lot of folks out there, and that's a very, very, very challenging uh, uh, topic, that are working on building quantum computers. Now, quantum computers are based and are operating different principles than uh, conventional uh, computers. The bits, you know, the, the, the tiny uh, unit of information for uh, quantum computers, it's called a qubit, quantum bit, and it makes a totally different quantum principle. Those are machines built on quantum mechanical principles. It's fascinating. When you go down the world of atoms and, and uh, particles, and things become very uncertain, and quantum mechanics becomes very mind-boggling sometimes, think about, based on this uncertainty, building a, a machine that does certain things. <laughs> uh, so Google, in collaboration with NASA, that's, that's news that came out uh, very recently, December 9, 2015. Google, in collaboration with NASA, are trying, you know, are making the first steps to, towards building D-Wave 2, one of the world's uh, early and first supercomputers. Uh, this is how it looks like, very expensive enterprise, and there's a lot of challenges, but if we manage to do that, you can read the headline, 100 million times faster than your PC. Several hundreds of thousands of million times faster than those supercomputers I was talking about. So if we ever manage to pull this off, we can do crazy things. We can do artificial intelligence. We have machines learning some reason, you know, by employing this computing power. It's going to be a revolution. I can't I really imagine what the world of Wall Street and finance mm -hmm. would look like if you run trading models in quantum computers. <laughs> so, you have the machinery and you have the computers, and, but you need the tools. It's not enough to have a powerful computer that's sitting around uh, doing additions and subtractions. You need to build a framework that is based on the laws of physics, and that's a whole science on its own, uh, and use that framework, that numerical framework, Properly run on these computers to run models and simulations of physical uh, physical systems. So, uh, in our case, in the University of Chicago, uh, the Flash Center, we have the Flash Code, which has been around for more than a couple of decades. 
Uh, one of the uh, very important constituents of the class code is sitting right around us. I know he doesn't want to be <laughs> so no, but class, put your hand up, it's okay. Very good. He's, uh, he's a really smart guy, a programmer, and uh, he's put a lot of lines of code in here. Uh, we couldn't have done it without people like without people like class. And class is a multi-physics code that can do several things. As I said, and I've been talking about in this uh, lecture series, it can do a lot of supernova explosions, explosions of white dwarfs or even core collapse supernova. I've shown you some of these movies throughout the lectures. Uh, and even more complicated uh, problems like galaxy mergers, when you have giant galaxies merging each other, what's going on? How is that matter redistributed upon to gal galactic cannibalism, in a way? Uh, you can even do high density physics experiments and lasers. And actually, a lot of our colleagues are using it primarily for laser experiments, generating magnetic fields. You know, out of uh, turbulence, out of nothing. It's, this is a very complicated process uh, that you can do, and all those are 3D examples. Uh, so you can do it in a variety of uh, problems. It's, you know, a lot of it, uh, uh, parts of it uh, is, you know, downloadable from the, from the general public, but you just have to uh, spend a lot of time learning how to use it. It's a learning curve. And in our daily lives, we don't just use, it's not a black box. We don't just press enter, you know, we don't put numbers in, we press enter and we get a nice supernova out that fits the universe. It's way more complicated than that. Uh, that would be nice, but uh, we have an expression in uh, computational uh, uh, physics, crap in, crap out. If your input is wrong, if your initial assumptions are wrong, and if you're solving them uh, carefully, you will get a wrong result. You have to be very careful how you solve things, and you have to balance between solving things carefully with computational efficiency. You have to sacrifice here and there. But uh, overall, you have to sit down and take those complicated uh, differential equations that describe, say, how temperature is changing over time, or how density is changing over time, or how nuclear reactions take place. And you have to break them down in small pieces, or discretize them, that's the jargon we use, uh, and then write a computer. You have to know computer programming, you have to know Fortran, several computer languages, C++, there's several others around. And you have to be able to translate those laws from pen and paper to a correct form in a computer. Do a lot of validation, a lot of testing. There's a lot of physical problems out there that we can solve analytically. So one common technique we're doing is to basically run simulations of, of physical systems that we know how they behave, and then compare the predictions of the, of the code with what we know is going on with the solve of the problem. And you can do a lot of verification and testing. Uh, and you know, we always update the code. It's not like we wrote it and it sits there. There's new pieces of physics, new capabilities added in all the time. We have to maintain it and update it, make it even more efficient, pivot. It's a continuous endeavor. And then the code is not just going to give you everything you want to solve the universe. Sometimes you might have to put your own physics, uh, or not your own physics, physics is physics, but there will be parts of physics that will be necessary to the problem that you're trying to solve, and then you're you going to be the responsible one creating a unit, coding it up, and uh, linking it to the rest of the tree of the code to solve this particular problem. So that's why this business is complicated and takes a lot, uh, a lot, a lot of time. Uh, so what is, after all, the key goal of this uh, supernova business and the future, and where are we going with this? Well, this goes back to the, you know, the foundations of the scientific method uh, itself. You have to, to see what the nature is telling you. You have to gather as much high quality data as possible and be careful how you interpret those data within errors because you're never going to measure something with perfect accuracy. You know, you're going to measure it with an uncertainty. It's going to be 1 plus minus 0 0.0001, you know. And you have to take this part down when you do uh, when you interpret uh, natural systems. It's not going to be, you know, computers might give you, might you think might give you zero errors because there's no observations, but there's other kinds of errors and the numerical errors that uh, can be important. Uh, so in, in terms of supernovae, we need a lot of them. You know, we have we have been collecting a lot of observations of many thousands of different kinds of supernovae, uh, and we need to discover them early on. And this technology I described to you in the beginning of the course. Is solving just a problem. Discovering fast, right after explosion, and then you have to use all the other uh, uh, high quality 
machinery and instruments to get high quality spectra and observations and follow it up all on in time. I think. And once you have that, you need money. Money is everywhere. Money, money, money. Uh, to hire people, uh, human resources. You need postdocs, uh, graduate students, programmers. Uh, you need to buy machines. You need you know, to travel to conference. You know, it's a lot of expenses that go into uh, you know being uh, an active uh, scientist in this field. Uh, and of course, the problem is that there's just so many data that we need this this number of people to, to analyze it. Sometimes we don't have you know, institutions don't have enough money to do that. And then once you have this, the next step is the interpretation, which is the high quality and modern type way of interpreting these things is by running realistic multi-dimensional, three-dimensional, universe three-dimensional simulations using supercomputers and state-of-the-art, uh, as we say, radiation transport boards. Because remember, <coughs> in astrophysics, all we have is light. Every information, every interpretation we have about stars, the galaxies, the universe, objects, it's not like we can fly out there in a, in a day, grab a sample, and come back and study in our laboratories. We have light, and we have to utilize physics, the laws of physics, and analyze this light as accurately uh, as possible. Uh, and the way we do this is by trying to understand how light propagates in space, how it interacts with matter. And that's a whole big piece of physics that we mainly solve in the supernova community when we want to compare what our models give us, which is the final goal, with what nature tells us. So this business is well, it's, it's an iterative process. You, have an, you see something, you have an idea about how it works, you have a first crack at it, uh, but it's not really perfect, and you have to go back and reiterate as you get better information, better data. It's a feedback loop, in a way. And reiterate and reiterate until you get something that gives you a very nice explanation over time, the space of how things evolve, how bright they are, what are the compositions, and so on and so forth. So, to summarize uh, today's lecture, and then I'm going to summarize or give you a general summary of the things we talked about. I emphasize on the importance of naked eye and even you know cheap telescope, amateur astronomy, and citizen science, and grass grassroots science in discovering supernovae, even new types of supernovae, and letting us astronomers know. Even 1987A, one of the most well-studied supernova was independently discovered by an amateur before you know before professional astronomers started looking at it. Uh, so it's important to emphasize that people uh, is helping a lot in this field. And uh, we have to be thankful for people giving out the free time to study supernovae and money, personal money to study supernovae. Um, and they're very, supernova are, uh, uh, it's very key for us to understand the early stages of the explosion. We've built technology, automated, we've utilized artificial intelligence, robotics, modern uh, computational techniques to discover this pretty fast. I showed you the example of the Roche telescope, how fast it looks in the sky. I told you about the challenges of doing that, but that, that's what you need. You need to solve the challenge to discover this as early on as possible. And then you need some, you have those early data and you need to know what kind of supernova you're talking about. So classification is important. You know, there's several classes or, or in the supernova zoo. And when you get an observation, you need to be able to match these observations to a certain class. You have to classify it and then decide if it's interesting enough whether to spend the money and the effort and the time to use bigger machines, either by jumping on the line and requesting a target of opportunity observation uh, to get better quality data. Uh, and then once you have that, that's where I come in, people like me, supercomputers uh, developing sophisticated codes and tools to simulate what we think gives rise to these explosions and the explosion processes and what the output is expected to look like. Uh, and this is the way we'll move forward in the future with advances in computer science, supercomputing, and advances in uh, modern observed uh, automated techniques to understand supernova. Uh, now, you know, I'm not yet going to close, just a couple more slides, but I just want to give you a little uh, paralypsis, a little uh, overview of all the things we talked about in this, uh, this fall semester. We went in a journey of supernova, exploding stars, and we're trying to understand why are they important, why, why do we even care about studying them, and what's uh, so fascinating about these things. When we, but to get there, we need to understand first how stars evolve. And we understood that it's massive stars that will give you a lot of core collapse, you know, supernova massive explosions, 
stars above the masses of eight times the mass of the sun, but it's also some stars, some special category of stars called white dwarfs, that if you, if you drop matter on them for more than a certain limit, they will explode. And those turn out to be very important for cosmology because they're so bright that they can be observed at extreme cosmological distances and help us uh, constrain the progress of the universe, the acceleration, the expansion of the universe. Uh, also, supernova, of course, are, you know, uh, it's a very diverse class of objects. It's not just an explosion that looks the same all over the place. They have differences in the way they get bright, in how bright they are, in the way they get dim. They're different uh, in, in the composition they have, what they're made of. Some of them have hydrogen in the spectrum. You see they have hydrogen, the most abundant element in the universe. Some of them don't. They have helium or other elements, carbon, oxygen. So using those differences, you can sub-classify the uh, supernova, and you will get a type 1 supernova will have hydrogen, and type 2 supernova that, uh, type 1 supernova that do not have hydrogen, I'm sorry, and type 2 that do have hydrogen. And then you can see subclasses, well, some of them have helium, well, some of them do not have helium, some of them. So by using all these observed features and properties of supernova, you can put them into little beans that more or less have the same characteristics between each other. And there's more, there's more diversity than that, because of course there is a super luminous supernova. And uh, that, was, uh, that has been one of the biggest focus of my career, my research. We recently discovered by using those automatic, those groundbreaking observ observational techniques, supernova that puzzle us, supernova that are 100 times, 10 to 100,000 times brighter than the average supernova. And then we're back in the drawing board. We have to understand why, what makes them special? Is it the fact that some stars are losing mass prior to exploding, and then they collide with this mass, which is a very popular scenario. Is it the fact that you have a fastly rotating magnetic star in the core that converts the magnetic rotational energy into radiation? Is it a lot of nickel, which is nickel is basically the primary source for most supernovae, are powered by nickel decay, by radioactive decay of nickel and cobalt? What is it? What are the power sources in and that opened up, that's the iteration part I'm talk, I talked about in the scientific method. We had something new, we had new data in the table, and we got back to the drawing board, pivot, we go back to try to understand how things work by employing all these um, complicated codes. And then why are they important? Well, I already mentioned one of the reasons, the cosmology, the fact that they're so bright, that you can see them at billions of light years away at the edge of the observable universe, try to constrain its properties. But of course they're important for another different reason. They're important because the elements we're made of, we're all made of stars, as, you know, as Carl Sagan might be saying. The elements we're made of are synthesized massive stars, and then they are dispersed in the universe by these explosions. Even during these explosions, there is the most heavy elements in the periodic table are formed, like uranium. Uh, so those are laboratories that synthesize the building blocks of life. Things like silicon, carbon, oxygen, the air we breathe, uh, composition of our blood composition of the DNA molecule. So th this is one of the other reasons that uh, they're very, very important. And of course, the future is advancements in robotic artificial intelligence and uh, supercomputing that will help us get an even better understanding of what, how they explode, why they explode. We might even find new engines. We might find objects that we never thought existed before, that we don't understand. There's always, it's going to be a never ending process, and that's why I like to close with this one, you know, just to quote another Greek philosopher, uh, <laughs> Tori. It is clear to everyone that astronomy at all events compels the soul to look upwards and draws it uh, from the things of this world to the other. So, thank you for your attention. <laughs>
And what about the James Webb telescope? Well, is that going to throw new light on uh, how to type more power? Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's the reason to build it. I mean, the James Webb, it's going to be an upgrade. It's going to be the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope. Ten, almost 10 times stronger. It's going to be sensitive in a certain part of the spectrum. And uh, it's going to look for uh, things like the primordial explosions. So what, as soon as the universe was born, a lot of the stars, we call population three stars, were very large. Hundreds, 200 times solar mass, some of them. And those explode in a different way. If you remember, I talked about uh, pair stability supernovae when I talked about superlunar supernovae. So one of the objectives of James Webb Space Telescope will be looking at the earliest galaxies that form, looking at uh, those early explosions of the early stars, but also doing a lot of planet, uh, planetary research, looking at protoplanetary disks, you know, how planets form around stars, mm -hmm. in greater detail, and things like that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, that quote from Plato, it doesn't, doesn't uh, work as much in modern times as it might have done then, because there's so many lights around these cities. You I know. You don't see them. <laughs> Nobody cares <laughs> The city lights are not uh, has no genuine light when it turns out. This is not nice. Well, that's why we build ourselves so far away from civilization. Right. 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 You right. can't see that from Chicago. I it know. It does not happen. That's why citizen scientists, scientists, I mean, they, it's, it's a lot of personal effort. They, it's not like they, they put money to buy new telescopes and they spend time. It's, sometimes they, they load up their SUVs and their trucks and they go out in the middle of nowhere and drive out two hours in the wilderness to do this. It's fascinating. Yeah. Uh, how is that you can explain the interaction of light traveling through space? What is the space properties that allow the light to travel only at that speed? Well, you know, I mean, uh, uh, there is when the light is produced. One, of the first problem, the first part of the problem is learning how to produce the light. And there are several microphysical properties that produce light. And then you have to understand how it gets transported. And there's several ways that lights can transport through matter. If matter is really thick, which means that there's a lot of particles around those photons, you can think of the photon as just bouncing back and forth between those different particles before it eventually gets out. This, this is called a random walk process, how the, the light diffuses out of matter. But then when the, the density of matter is really low, and there's not really much matter out there, the light particles, the photons, simply, the electromagnetic waves, simply free stream. They just trap through this free stream. Well, yeah. but it's not really free because it depends on the some properties of the empty space, right? The light yeah, you know, everything happens in space and time, you know. So but there's nothing uh, specific about the you know the, the fabric you know the, the fabric of space times will change the course of light sometimes. So what, what sometimes will happen is if you have light free streaming traveling in a straight line, okay, towards you, and there's a really massive object interfering between you and that light source, that massive object is going to curve space. <laughs> so the light is going to bend. It's going to be like a lens, a gravitational lens, as we call it. It's going to change the course of light. It might magnify the source as well. So space plays a role in some ways. But light in, in very low density material in the vacuum will travel free streaming as well. So, so the question that arises to me because suppose that the universe is so big and after that there is empty, no universe, right? If the light will be able to travel without the space time that is within our, our universe, then the universe will be losing energy if this, uh, if this light will escape. So, so it got to be some, something that it tells us how the light is able to, to, to be transmitted within the universe in a space-time, and if it could go out of the universe. Well, uh, I would say the edge of the observable universe goes as far back as the first photons were able to escape uh, matter generated. So 13.7, oh, about billion year, light years away is as much as you can receive information. We can't say anything. So if you if the universe is really like you know that big and that's an imaginary, not at all real, you know, uh, boundary, and this is how this is the bubble that we see because that's how far 
life has traveled over the last 13.7 uh, billion years. So you know, there's probably space out there. We can't. No, see. my question is not on the first circle, but it's after the second circle. I don't know. No, but I don't have no idea what's going on. So maybe you can tell me. Yeah, yes, sir. Um, would it help computational astrophysics if we took up a collection here today? <laughs> you can try. You can try. Citizen science. We can link your laptops to it. <laughs> yes. Another question. Is this Flash um, is that a computer language that is um, completely different from others? No. Flash is just the name of the code. We, we, we name codes. We give them some silly names sometimes, actually. One of them is called Sedona. Uh, you know, it's all kinds of because of the scientist's loved one. The name was Sedona and named the code Sedona, whatever. But we just call uh, we just call it Flash, uh, but it's written in special language. In, in our case, most of the code is written in Fortran. Okay, okay. it's mostly in Fortran. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes, sir. Fortran ninety. Is there a yes. definite theory of the evolution or life cycle of supernovae so to predict them from beginning to end? Evolution cycle, cycle of supernovae. Long life cycle. Yeah, that's known for anything. You mean if we have prior knowledge? No, do we have a theory now that encompasses the life cycle of evolution? Yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've been, uh, I've been emphasizing on the the evolution of the explosions and the progress of the explosion in these lectures. Basically, you have to start with the star, and then depending on what kind of star you have, how fast it rotates, how massive it is. You can follow the core collapse, which is a very complicated process. You have to simulate, and then that core collapse will generate a shock wave. Okay. The challenge is to, regenerate, to reinvigorate the shock wave, okay. which is very complicated. It happens with neutrinos, play a role there. Okay. Uh, and then that a shock wave is eventually going to expand out and blow up the entire star. Okay. Uh, and then the mass of the star is just going to keep expanding in space. It's going, to, it's going to be like a snow plow kind of process, slowly expanding as it expands. And processes are like nuclear synthetic processes throughout this space will be forming uh, just because you have a lot of radiation, a lot of radioactive material that you form, nickel and cobalt. You will have synthesizing uranium and all kinds of elements as it goes through. And over, over a long period of time, you pretty much disperse in space. And if you're close enough to sites where stars are born, you can contaminate those sites with heavier elements. And then stars will be born with more metals, <coughs> more silicon from the relics of the old supernovae. And if you're lucky enough, you'll get a planet, a little rocky planet okay. that's in the right distance with water and blah, 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 and DNA. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The Fort Davis telescope, the robotic one, when was that uh, built? How long was that? That was built in the early 2000s. But it was used for supernovae specific research. 2005 ish, 2004. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, can the public uh, see any demonstrations if they go see that? If time? you go to West Texas, they will be more than happy to show you around and show you how it Yeah, I've been there years ago, but I think yeah. it was before they had this uh, robotic. Telescope. But they do demonstrate the uh, robotic telescope. Exactly. If you go in the daytime, where it's, they're not using it much, mm -hmm. uh, they can show you how quickly it operates and how it responds. Oh, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I believe it was one of your, your slides I was looking for. Did, didn't you say gamma rays cannot be focused? Well, the, uh, it, it was hard when they discovered gamma ray bursts the first time. Those explosions that were very brief, they last for 30 seconds. They were very rich. Yeah, they are. But technically, it was very hard to find the source because of the brief duration of the gamma ray burst. Uh, and it was also challenging to build you know, gamma ray telescopes to collect this gamma ray because there are a few photons. The more you go up in energy in some of these events, so X-rays is more energetic, energetic than optical, gamma rays is even more energetic than X-rays. You have less, fewer photons. It's a challenge to try to get as many photons as, as you need in such a short amount of time to localize where they came from. Gotcha. But they can be focused. Yeah, right now we have to do that. Yeah. <coughs> Anything else? Thank you all. Let's go get some food.